like morning's twilight in an ancient paradise. Pastel aura ascends over what in prehistoric times was an oasis, what is now Little Salt Spring in Northport, Florida. Artifacts abound testifying how once thundering mastodons, saber-toothed tigers, giant sloths towering 20 feet tall roamed this land and drank from this freshwater spring. They were not alone. No one is more dedicated to piecing together the puzzle of Little Salt Springs past than marine archaeologist and University of Miami professor Dr. John Gifford. After 25 years and hundreds of dives, he finds it still invigorating leading the exploration of one of the most significant archaeological sites on the continent. And you're going to point out this object. Okay. And um, I'm going to measure it. Yeah. And uh, then we're going to put it back. Okay. Gifford's right research assistant, archaeologist oh, yeah. Steve oh, Kosky, and diving safety officer Rick Gomez are crucial members of the team. This geological wonder never ceases to intrigue only when you actually come here and, and dive in it do you really begin to uh, appreciate how unique this is. It's a sinkhole, but there are a lot of sinkholes in Florida. It's a spring. It's, it's a flowing spring. There are not that many sinkholes that are also springs. It's an underwater archaeological site, and there are perhaps two or three such features that are sinkholes and springs and underwater sites in the, in the state of Florida. From the surface, it looks like any other picturesque pond in Florida. Go underneath, spine tingling. A 40 foot deep bowl with a massive hole in the middle. The bell shaped sinkhole plunges an astounding 245 feet into the earth. As you swim down to a depth of 40 feet, you can come to the, what we call the drop off which is where the water depth increases suddenly from 40 feet to uh, 200 feet. And so it's like, it, you're, it's like swimming over a cliff because as, after you pass that drop off, you, you can't see anything anymore. It's black, it's a big hole. Only three divers have ever worked the deepest reaches of the abyss. One of them, Rick Gomez. Oh, going to the bottom is like going to outer space. You know, uh, as you, you leave the surface and it's nice and uh, sunny up here and beyond 100 feet, you're not gonna have any light at all. It's all artificial light. When you first hit the bottom, it's about 200 feet. Uh, and then it slowly tapers off till we get to a maximum depth here of about 245 feet. But yeah, it's kind of cool. An ironic archeological bonus, the water creates a natural preservative. Most of the water in the spring has come from thousands of feet down below the, the ground surface. It's been underground for so long that it has no uh, dissolved oxygen. It means that there is very, very little uh, bacterial decomposition of organic material. So consequently, we are able to excavate uh, wooden tools that are nine, 10,000 years old, which normally would not last 90 or 100 years uh, in any other body of water. Little Salt Spring divulges its secrets piece by precious piece, a 12,000 year old bone from an extinct giant sloth among the 200 artifacts recovered so far. Gifford's ultimate discovery would be evidence of the first humans in North America. He is quietly confident that that goal is within reach. The first traces of people we have here are approximately 12,000 radiocarbon years, and they were very clearly hunting these extinct animals. Here at Little Salt Spring, we have some remains of the extinct animals. We are finding these uh, thousands of year old wooden artifacts. 
we have no, no reference to go to to say, well, this is what we found because nobody else has found any. A history-making find, the 12,000-year-old shell of an extinct giant tortoise and the spear used to kill the animal, still underwater near the recovery site. We have a few campfires where fires were built. Part of a deer antler with 28 carved notches could be the oldest calendar on this side of the planet. One of the most significant artifacts, a possible link to the ancient or paleo Indians who inhabited Little Salt Spring, one of 15 pine wood stakes. The fact that there are so many of them suggests that there was some sort of activity that involved somehow getting down to the surface of the water, which would have been roughly 50 feet below its present position. During the last ice age, around 20,000 years ago, such an abundance of Earth's moisture was trapped in ice that water levels across the globe plummeted. The top basin of Little Salt Spring would have been dry land, a desirable campsite. This was an oasis, quite very simple. Uh, it was one of the few places in Florida that you could find fresh water, even though it was 50 or 60 feet down. Uh, people, of course, could lower themselves or lower a bucket, but um, for, for most animals, uh, if they accidentally got too close to the edge and they fell in, it was also a giant trap. And sometimes a death trap for humans. 23 years ago, a, a skull was excavated from here that um, turned out to be about 7,000 years old and, and uh, the brain tissue was still fairly well preserved, which is of course again an indication of the unique water chemistry here. Underwater archaeology is an amazing dichotomy of daunting danger and patient precision. What we're doing is sort of fanning the sediment away and every time you move a little bit of sediment, you sort of stop and, and look to see what you've uncovered. So we're basically excavating uh, a, a thin layer at a time. It's a very, very slow process. If you can imagine um, wearing a spacesuit and doing an excavation, that's pretty much the way it is excavating underwater. There were years when funding was rather hostile too. Early on, Gifford and crew lost 10 years of exploration when money for dives dried up. The general rule of thumb amongst uh, archeologists is that uh, what we do underwater takes uh, between five and 10 times as much money as on land to do the same thing. Little Salt Spring and its surrounding 112 acres of real old Florida were donated 25 years ago to the University of Miami for research and preservation. Dr. Gifford teaches at the university's prestigious Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, and then anxiously returns to his life's passion, Little Salt Spring. What we have is the possibility, and it's only a possibility, of finding uh, the earliest remains of, of humans that have yet been found in the Western Hemisphere. And if we could have 12,000-year-old DNA, we could certainly answer a, a large number of questions immediately concerning when and where the first people came from in, in the Western Hemisphere. There's growing evidence that the popular Bering Strait crossing for humans to reach this continent might be all wet. The first arrivals to North America may have come much earlier and by boat. Two ice sheets separating at just the right time for people to walk down this corridor from, it, from Alaska to uh, northern United States. That was awfully fortuitous. The corridor would only have opened up uh, about 11,500 to 12,000 years ago if you allow people to come by sea. They bypass all of the ice. They can arrive here thousands of years earlier. I can't imagine that if people were in this area, say 13, 14,000 years ago, that they would not come to Little Salt Spring because it was an oasis. So this is the place to look. The answer to one of the greatest mysteries in archaeology might rest in Little Salt Spring.